Welcome to the Going Beyond Your Beliefs podcast. My name is Jeffrey Taylor, and I will be your host. Let's start out with a definition. Beliefs are the subjective, unverifiable assumptions through which people or groups of people using as building blocks to construct their current worldviews, both secular and religious. Everyone wants to think that their beliefs are factually the truth. So how do we know the truth? Alas, the scientific method will not help us here, since it can only prove a hypothesis false. It can never conclusively prove anything true. Philosophy, logic, and mathematics are no help either. Gödel's incompleteness theorem demonstrated that for any logical or mathematical system, there will always be statements about that system that are true, but that are not provable from within the system. Again, that doesn't say that the truth may not be out there, but the intellectual tools to prove it true don't appear to easily exist. So how we use our beliefs should always bear these points in mind. Let's go to a Clint Eastwood movie. Dirty Harry sums this situation up eloquently when he stated in the movie Magnum Force, a man's got to know his limitations. Beliefs are loaded with limitations. I've heard numerous religious groups refer to themselves as a community of believers. And I must confess that I'm not sure what they mean by this statement. Don't all people have beliefs? In all my life, I never met a human being that was totally devoid of beliefs. So I'm going to assume that by this statement, they're referring to a community sharing commonly held beliefs that they hold to be true. Now, some people would interpret this statement to mean an exclusive community of people who hold the correct beliefs. The implication here is that those outside the community believe incorrectly, so-called heretics, or perhaps they are just uneducated and need to be informed. In the latest polls, over 90% of all Americans say they believe in God. Yet if you drill down on this statement, you find that God is believed in through very, very different ways. At this point, let me interject that beliefs are a little bit like pesticides. More is not better. The problem, however, is not in the supposed correctness of beliefs, but rather in how we use and act on these beliefs. All beliefs should be treated the same way we view modern-day antibiotics and pesticides. If used sparingly, with knowledge, and only where appropriate, much good is realized. If, however, they are used to extreme excess and without proper supervision or care, they can become harmful, as in the case of pesticides, or ineffective, as in the case of antibiotics. Apparently, it is permissible to question one's beliefs. However, changing one's belief is very much culturally frowned upon, especially in Christianity and Islam. After all, if your beliefs are true, where does that leave you when you change them? Yet life has a way of changing what people think is important and what we believe. Change happens with growth. One religion that joyfully embraces change and is willing to modify its belief is Buddhism. Christians and Muslims have had an exclusive approach to their beliefs and worldviews. Those not holding to the orthodox beliefs of the group are looked on as being at best outside the community of believers or at worst, heretics. In either case, the solution is to convert said individuals to the correct belief, or else. It's the or else part that's tricky here. The convert or die approach has been responsible for untold wars and human misery for thousands of years. Even when the conversion has been consensual, it has usually been accompanied by a horrendous loss of cultural identity. Even in the current climate of multiculturalism, and religious tolerance, where people aren't killed or ostracized for their different religious beliefs, there is still a lingering attitude of, if others just believe the way I do, they would all be much better persons. For Christians, correct belief is essential. 
so much so that creeds have been developed to aid the individual in knowing exactly what to believe. The principal Christian creeds were all developed during the first 600 years of the religion. At this time, most of the world was illiterate, and the simple creed was a vehicle for easy memorization of teaching correct Christian belief. We're going to consider the major Christian creeds developed from about 45 CE to 500 CE, CE meaning the current era. Only the first creed is free from significant religious propaganda used by the early Christian church as a tool to ensure harmony of the masses. Note the length in words for each of the creeds over time. Number one, Jesus is Lord. Three words. The Apostles' Creed, 110 words. The Chalcedonian Creed, 208 words. Number four, the Nicene Creed, comes in at 271 words. And the fifth, the Athanasian Creed, comes in at a whopping 658 words. There is an interesting trend here. Apparently, the core beliefs of Christianity expand over time and required more words to communicate them correctly. This apparently is a feature that creeds share with the U.S. tax code. If you Google a list of Christian creeds, you easily get back several hundred responses. It appears that every denomination, sect, or meeting group in just about every country of the globe has a modern-day creed. This puts creeds, or religious creeds, at the functional level of a corporate mission statement. So here's one humble idea I would like to toss out in the midst of all this belief proliferation. Beliefs are only a means to an end. They are not the end in itself. Many Eastern religions treat beliefs very cautiously to ensure they don't become the central objects of spiritual dogma and desire. In other words, creeds can become idols and objects of worship. Beliefs are not God, nor should they be substituted for the idea of God. Beliefs are only subjective mental objects and as such can be either helpful or harmful to one's own spiritual growth. Beliefs are also not the truth. Although they may share a metaphysical likeness to the shadows on Plato's cave wall, more on that in another podcast. If one holds on to beliefs too tightly, then they become a dead weight to spiritual change and understanding. Beliefs are the basis of our worldview, which we need to spiritually develop and learn. Life is all about risking our precious beliefs as a trade-off for true spiritual enlightenment. Let me take a brief aside here to talk about the name Jesus. I will not be using the name Jesus because it's really not his real name. His parents, siblings, disciples, and followers most likely called Jesus by his shortened version of the name Yeshua. Yeshua is a form of the Hebrew name Joshua. The name Jesus is a misspelling and mispronunciation that resulted from the translation of Yeshua's Aramaic name after his death. Yeshua was first translated into the Greek, Iesus, and then from the Greek, Iesus, into the Latin, Iesus. From Latin, it was transliterated into Old English. Jesus was not pronounced Jesus in Old English because the letter J didn't exist in the Old English language. It was not until the end of the 17th century that the English letter J was invented. The King James Bible, written at the beginning of the 17th century, has the name Iesus without the J. So now to get back to our topic, let me tender a metaphor here. Let's think of belief as rungs on a ladder. One has to climb to grow, learn, and live. To make progress up the ladder, one must be willing to risk taking one's foot off the ladder's lower rung to move to the next higher rung. Giving up those old beliefs is a scary thing. It's uncomfortable because maybe that next rung up there might not support your weight and you could fall. Yeshua certainly understood that spiritual growth could not be achieved without risk and discomfort. 
You have to be willing to put your foot out in the air and reach for the next higher level with faith that the spiritual reward of a new understanding will be worth it all. Many Christian theologians are challenging the old, entrenched, creed-based belief systems. The title for this post was taken from Elaine Pagel's book, Beyond Belief, The Secret Gospel of Thomas. In this book, she conducts an examination of the earliest Christian text, arguing for an ongoing reinstatement of faith and a questioning of religious creeds based on orthodoxy. Discoveries of ancient spiritual texts, along with other archaeological discoveries, are bringing to light new information that challenges the old beliefs. We must be prepared to consider how faith allows for a diversity of interpretations, the recognition of the light within us all. So let's talk a little bit about John Wesley and creeds. The short end of it is he didn't like them very much. Let's take a closer look at creeds and the confessional dogma they spawn. Confessional statements are the activist instruments of hardcore creed-based beliefs. Confessionalism, I think that's a word, confessionalism in a religious sense is a dogma regarding the importance, the importance of full and unambiguous assent to the whole of all religious teachings. Confessional religions believe that differing interpretations or understandings, especially those in direct oppositions to a held teaching, cannot be accommodated within a church communion. In their extreme usage, creeds and confessional statements are the verbal and written weapons that religions use against each other. In their benign form, creeds codify and inform our faith. But in the Methodist tradition, we do not equate creeds with faith. The word creed comes from the Latin credo, meaning I believe. The United Methodist Church states on its website, while the articles of religion and the confession of faith are considered foundational documents, they are not legalistic or dogmatic creeds that do not allow for differing interpretations. They are guidelines. Sounds a little bit like uh, Jack Sparrow in the... Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, more like a guideline than a rule. Anyway, they're guidelines that in themselves require continued reflection, interpretation, and expansion in light of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. This is somewhat unique within the range of Christian denomination. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, sought Christianity more in practical principles and sanctified affectations than in dogmatic orthodox formulas, and he laid greater stress on the ecumenical consensus which unites all religions rather than on the sectarian dissensions which divide us. Wesley clearly considered creeds and confessional assent as unnecessary in a relationship with God. In his Sermon 7, The Way of the Kingdom, he states, and I quote, For neither does religion consist in orthodoxy, or write opinions, which, although they are not properly outward things, are not in the heart, but the understanding. A man may be orthodox in every point. He may not only espouse right opinions, but zealously defend them against all opposers. He may think justly concerning the incarnation of our Lord, concerning the ever-blessed Trinity, and every other doctrine contained in the oracles of God. He may assent to all the three creeds that are called Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian. And yet, it is possible that he may have no religion at all. Wesley was far more concerned with how an individual treated his fellow humans, how one lived his life in harmony with others, as well as how one prayed and meditated to enhance communion with God. In this, he sounds very much like the Buddha and Krishna. Wesley got the ideas from the teachings of Yeshua found in the New Testament scriptures, not from any creed. He certainly realized that the earliest creeds were statements on the relationship defining God, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit. More importantly, they spelled out exactly what we should think or believe about the relationship with each other and us. The Athanasian Creed adds a nice touch in the final line, kind of drives it all home, and I quote, 
This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe truly and firmly, he cannot be saved. In other words, believing everything stated in the Athanasian Creed, all 600 plus words, believe it or burn in hell. In addition, Wesley was not in agreement with many of the Church of England's beliefs on religion. These 39 articles of religion were developed by the Church of England as doctrine. Wesley, as a priest in the Church of England, was bound by English law to support all 39 articles of religion, literally, and not to amend them. When the Methodists of the former colonies, at the time the newly formed United States, began to plan for a Christmas conference in 1784, Wesley sent them an abridged version of only 25 of the 39 articles. One of the articles rejected by Wesley was this one. Article 8. Article 8 of all three creeds. The three creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and that which is commonly called the Apostles' Creed, ought thoroughly to be received and believed, for they are proved to be the most certain warrants of the Holy Scripture. That was the one he rejected. It is unknown if Wesley ever received a reprimand for his abridgment of the articles. So why was Wesley not impressed with creeds and their associated confessional statements? Put simply, he was just as concerned with what Yeshua taught in his earthly ministry as well as what the creed said Yeshua was as the Christ. The understanding of what Yeshua taught was hard work as well. And it required the application of study through reason, tradition, the scriptures, and experience, oftentimes known as the Wesley quadrilateral. Now, absolutely none of these four legs of the quadrilateral are required with regard to creeds. The purpose of a creed is to supply an easily remembered, recitable summary of what you need to believe. No thinking required or wanted. In addition, most creeds are like a donut with a hole in the middle. They are pretty on the outside, but they're empty in the middle. What Wesley realized is that all creeds mentioned here have a huge hole in the middle. As far as the Yeshua of the creeds is concerned, he was born, died, rose, and ascended. Little is mentioned of what happened in between. Let's consider the earliest major creed, the Apostles' Creed. The most significant thing about the creed is the omission of Yeshua's baptism, his teaching, his fulfillment as the Messiah, his works, or his relationship with the disciples or John the Baptist. The Apostles' Creed does not summarize the original Christian gospel either. This is a far cry from what those first followers of the Yeshua movement used for a gospel, the Q document. This resource contained nothing but sayings and parables of Jesus starting with the Sermon on the Mount. These early Yeshua disciples were concentrating on the message of Rabbi Yeshua, not on the Christology of the rabbi. Wesley correctly focuses on the message of Yeshua as it is lived and practiced in our daily lives. The Apostles' Creed is an attempt at a doctrinal stance that proclaims a God of might and power and omits references to a God of love, to the kingdom of God, repentance, faith, the divinity within all humans, or the nature of the Christian life. Although the creed cannot be ignored, it is obvious that there is so much more to the traditions of Christianity. Surely Wesley was right in his understanding that creeds had to be complemented by scripture, reason, and tradition. The problem with confessional dogma is that it has no faith. It is attempting to systematize God and bolt down our faith to make it immovable. In other words, a vehicle of ironclad belief through what it omits or specifies. It is an attempt to imprison us in an exclusive worldview that encompasses the Christian faith. As such, it does not serve a living church of a rational people. Never in the Wesleyan tradition is the, in the, is the identity of Methodists defined by right doctrine. It is defined by right living. The test of authentic faith for Wesley is the practice of holiness and a life that is manifested in love of God and neighbor. This practical holiness defines mission, identity in life, 
and in compassion together. In other words, it is grounded in the teachings of Yeshua, but it's also grounded in the teachings of the Buddha and Krishna, for that matter. Yeshua said, Unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It is clear that children are too young to have become captive of their society's ideology and have developed vested interests in property, nationalism, war, racial, and other prejudices. Children are incapable of understanding dogma. James A. Sanders, president of the Ancient and Biblical Manuscript Center and professor of International and Biblical Studies at Claremont School of Theology, summarizes Beth's The Whole Case Against the Use of Creeds as Confessions. And I quote from his book, Canon and Community, page 37. No one person, no denomination, no theology, and certainly no ideology can exhaust the Bible or claim its unity. It bears with its own redeeming contradiction, and this is a major reason it has lasted so long. Once a theme or strain or thread rightly perceived in the Bible has been isolated and absolutized, it simply becomes available for challenge from another theme or strain also there. The whole Bible, of whichever canon, can never be stuffed into one theological box. Although hotly debated among Methodists today, it would appear that they have inherited a Wesleyan legacy of a non-confessional church. As one Methodist minister once told me, and I quote, All are welcome in the Methodist congregation to worship God and meet in fellowship. It doesn't matter if they are Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, or Muslim. All are free to be in communion with God as they see fit. So let me use a scientific principle here to perhaps simplify our creedal references. Unlike the Iowa caucuses, where a tie is broken by a coin flip, science has a different way of choosing between theories when data is indecisive. It's called Occam's razor. The razor is a problem-solving principle attributed to William of Occam, who lived from 1287 to 1347. He was an English Franciscan friar and scholastic philosopher and theologian. The principle was extolled by both William of Occam and by Einstein. Occam stated, no more things should be presumed to exist than are absolutely necessary. The fewer assumptions an explanation of a phenomenon depends on, the better the explanation. Or as Einstein summarized it, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So following Occam's razor, here are five radically simplified creeds that span the world's religions. They are about as basic as you can get, factually accurate, non-confrontational, and not in contradiction with each other. Here they are in order from the oldest to the most recent. The oldest, Krishna is Lord. Next, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Number three, Buddha is master. Number four, Yeshua is Lord. And finally, number five, Mohammed is the prophet of God. To finish up, I'm going to leave you with a poem. And I hope I can do this with that by reading it and not screwing it up. It's a poem by Sam Walter Foss. You may not be familiar with Sam Walter Foss. He didn't write many poems, but the ones he did write were pretty darn good. This is his poem called Odium Theologicum. They met and they talked where the crossroads met, four men from the four winds come. And they talked of the horse, for they loved the theme, and never a man was dumb. The man from the north loved the strength of the horse, and the man from the east his pace. And the man from the south loved the speed of the horse, and the man from the west his grace. So these four men from the four winds come, each paused a space in his course, and smiled in the face of his fellow man, and lovingly talked of the horse. Then each man parted and went his way, as their different courses ran, and each man journeyed with peace in his heart and loving his fellow man. They met the next year where the crossroads meet. Four men from the four winds come, 
and it chanced as they met that they talked of God, and never a man was dumb. One imagined God in the shape of a man. A spirit, did one insist. One said that nature itself was God. One said that he didn't exist. They lashed each other with tongues that stung. They smote as with a rod. Each glared in the face of his fellow man and wrathfully talked of God. Then each man parted and went his way as their different courses ran, and each man journeyed with wrath in his heart and hating his fellow man.